while they're being seated, we'll have a word of prayer. Father, we're so grateful, Lord, that we can come to you through your son, Jesus Christ, Lord. And we know that what he's accomplished for us gives us an opportunity and an audience, really, with you, Father, that we can talk to you anytime we want and know that our prayers are heard. Father, sometimes we move along here and we, we move away from you, Father. We do things that are out of line with your will, and the first thing you know, we've drifted from you, and, and Lord, uh, you're so gracious and so merciful to try to draw us back to you. And I pray, Father, that uh, if that's the case for any one of us this morning, Lord, that we would, be, that we would listen to the message, uh, Lord, that it would not be a message that came from the preacher, but a message that came from you, Lord, that you laid on the preacher's heart. And Father, help us, Lord God, to draw closer to you. Uh, Father, if there be somebody here that has never really been in a walk with you, they've never uh, experienced salvation, the forgiveness of sins, and so they're, uh, they don't know what it is. And Lord, they're missing out. And I just pray, Father, that you'll just help them to realize this morning that, uh, that they can walk with, the, with you, God, uh, if they accept the son, your son, Jesus Christ. Father, we have a great group here this morning. We're excited about the baptisms after the service. But right now, we just pray that your Holy Spirit will settle our hearts and our minds, open our ears, and Lord, allow us to just uh, hear from you. And I pray that you'll move in the congregation, both here in this auditorium and in the back as the children are being taught as well. And we'll thank you and praise you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll turn your Bibles over to Genesis chapter 3. We were uh, at the men's conference yesterday, and one of the preachers, uh, uh, well, maybe that was uh, the night before, but nonetheless, at the conference, one of the preachers got over in Genesis 1, 2, and 3, and I thought, oh, man, he's going to get into my message, and, and then I'm going to come home, and the men are going to think I copied my message from him, and it's all going to be ugly, but he didn't. He, he, he moved around the things I was going to talk about. I prepared this earlier in the week. Uh, when we read the Word of God, it's so rich uh, with meaning, uh, at, with truth, and it's so rich that we can read it day after day, year after year, and still discover new things uh, that we've not seen before, things that we haven't understood before. Well, just uh, oftentimes it, 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 it's not a whole entire chapter or text that jumps off the page at us and speaks to us, but rather it's a simple phrase or a, a small detail in a story or an exchange that's taking place. And this morning we're going to look at an, at an example of this. In my Bible reading, uh, in the reading schedule that I use, it always has me in the book of Genesis at the beginning of the year, which is, is uh, pretty appropriate because the word uh, Genesis uh, means beginnings. And so uh, my Bible reading will have me in Genesis at the first of the year. Uh, Genesis is the beginnings of, of a lot of things. Uh, it's a very appropriate title. Uh, the beginning of the universe you can read about, the beginning of earth and mankind and animal life. But sadly, it also has the record of the beginning of sin. And uh, for that reason, uh, there's, uh, uh, there's, there's so much that we can learn in these very early chapters about, in, in Genesis, about where we are today and how we are today, okay? But this book, Genesis, is hands down my favorite book of the Bible to read, uh, just as far as just the enjoyment of it. Fifty chapters, 1,533 verses in the book of Genesis, and it's just a very enjoyable study for me, and I hope you feel the same way. It's a, it just happens to be my, my favorite book. So here in chapter 3, we're going to read the story of Adam and Eve. They're eating of the forbidden fruit. Most all of us are familiar uh, with, that, uh, with this chapter, and it's going to obviously the introduction of sin because they ate of the forbidden fruit, and, and that sin forever changed the dynamics of the, uh, the, the relationship between God and man. And, but we're, we're only going to read the first nine verses, and then in chapter nine is where, uh, where we're going to make camp and, and find the words, uh, the three words that really jump out at us out of this story. Okay, beginning in verse one, it says, Now the serpent, we know that uh, that was the devil, Satan, was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree in the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, 
We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband uh, with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Where art thou? Now right here is the three words that... Uh, that jump out of this story for me, and, and it's, uh, uh, there's a number of messages along the way, even in my years here, I've preached on this particular subject before, but what I want to understand about that question that God asked, where art thou? God is asking this question to Adam out of great concern. He didn't come to him, he didn't shout, Adam, what have you done? Uh, you've really made a mess of things now, Adam, and boy, are you in trouble, Adam. He just came with the words of concern and said, Adam, where art thou? And here's what we have to understand about God is, yes, he will judge sin. He does judge sin, okay? He's capable of displaying great amounts of wrath, and he, with just a simple word, can call down fire from heaven. Yes, all of that is true. But we do not serve a brutal God. We do not serve an unloving God who is just waiting for the opportunity to condemn us. That's not who we serve. His wrath and His judgments, when they do come, always come on the heels of several steps of love and compassion that are trying to draw us to the right spot in our lives. It's our refusal. It's our failing to be... Uh, cooperative with those gestures of concern and love that gets us into a point where the chastisement and the correction comes. Those steps that God takes in love and concern are designed to bring us back into His care and to bring us back into sweet fellowship with Him. And when He gets no response, then He has to take, his, his, it, take it a step further. But I'm convinced, folks, that we have to work at being apart from God, because he's continually himself working at the relationship, working to keep us close to him. And in, in my Bible uh, schedule uh, that I'm reading, and some of you share the same one, so you'll know this, but right now it has us in Jeremiah on Fridays. Our Friday reading is in Jeremiah. And when you read God's message to his children uh, in Jeremiah, to the children of Israel, those words are delivered to them by the prophet Jeremiah. But what you find as Jeremiah pleads with the people is really it's God pleading with his people to stop their sin, to stop their rebellion, to return to him. He warns them repeatedly of the damage that's going to result by the decisions that they're making. He shares with them in his words, how good things can be if they'll get right and walk closely with him. And, and in reality, that book, when you read it, just shows the great amount of patience that God has with his children. I mean, he really, really works at this deal with us. And this is something that I found in his dealings with myself as an individual. Uh, we see it in his dealings with nations. And we also see it with his dealings with the church. If you were to go over to Revelation chapter 1, 2, and 3, and you'd read about the seven uh, churches of Asia Minor, and you find that very principle in dealing with those seven churches. He's, he's, he's compelling them to, to, uh, uh, to change some things before it's too late. He cautions them. He warns them that, hey, if something doesn't get fixed here, there's going to be a problem. But it's all his, his desire to get those churches back into his 
will. So God is doing His part in making this relationship uh, uh, work. And so it's with great concern that He asked Adam, Where art thou? Where are you? It's, after, it's, it's as if God's saying, Adam, what's happened? Why aren't you coming out to walk with me this evening? Adam, what, uh, we, we usually spend time together. We, we, we usually walk and talk. And, and Adam, I miss you this evening. In a group this size this morning, there's little doubt, but that there's someone within the sound of my voice whose relationship with God is strained right now. Maybe many people, maybe dozens of people whose relationship with God has been hindered. Something has become, come between the two of you, or the two of us, me and God. Things are not right with Him. Well, you can be sure of this, that if things are not right between us and God, the obstacle that's been thrown out there didn't come from God. It came from us. It's happened on our end. We're the sinners. He's the perfectly holy God. And so this morning through this sermon, maybe God is saying to you, where art thou? He said, where art thou, Adam? Insert your name in there, perhaps. Where art thou, Susie? Where art thou, Chris? Where art thou, David? Uh, where art thou, Tricia? Maybe he's chosen this morning to use this very message to ask you that question with love and concern in his voice he's calling wayward Christians who were once close to him to return but here's what often happens rather than when we hear from God and he's drawing us to him rather than make a beeline back to him we often try some alternative routes I hear you, God, but let me try this and see if this works. Let me try this other thing and see if it works. Here's, here's one of the things that Adam tried. Uh, he, he tried to cover up his sin. You notice in verse 7 that he and Eve, it says, the eyes of them both were open. They were in this together. And they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Don't you see how foolish that is? They looked so foolish, thinking that somehow they could sew leaves together and cover up their problem, their sin problem. It reminds me of an experience we had many, many years ago, speaking of foolishness. Uh, uh, we, Tom Adams, many of you all remember Tom. He was, helped raise me. He was my brother-in-law. And we cowboyed together for well, my whole life until, uh, until I came here. And we were out gathering uh, what we call mavericks. If you're a cowboy, you know what that is. If you're not, it's just a, a, it's a steer or a heifer or, or a bull that's, that's never been caught or branded. They're just kind of feral out there in the pasture. You gather everything else up, and they tend to escape every time, and so you got to go after them. you got to go rope them. And what they'll do is they'll brush up. They get smart. They'll learn to get in the mesquite, and they'll just hide out when they see horses or uh, cowboys coming. And so we were in a pasture one day that, uh, uh, to go try to catch uh, this maverick out, that was out there. We knew he was out there, Tom and I, but we had to search for him. But there was no mesquite. All there were were these little cedar trees, the, the little uh, the small cedars that you see in the pastures, especially up in the panhandle. And so we're riding along there. We're looking, and Tom waves at me like He waves at me like that. And I come trotting up there, and this about 700-pound steer has no place to hide his body. He's got his head in a cedar like this. <laughs> and he's just still as he can be. <laughs> I mean, he's, how, you see how foolish that is? He thinks he's hiding. He thinks he can get, with his 700-pound body, he can hide out and get away from us in a little tree. That's what Adam did and Eve did. They've got a 700-pound situation with their sin, and they think they can take fig leaves and sew them together and hide from God. They look so foolish. And you and I look equally as foolish when we try to hide our sins. We don't use leaves to cover our sins, but we use sometimes we use excuses. We rationalize. We try to explain it away. We try little acts of service that maybe will camouflage some of the wrongdoings that we're doing in our lives. We, we try to slip in a little Sunday morning church that, uh, that will maybe overshadow 
the things that are going on in our life throughout the week. We try to justify our actions by measuring them against other people. Well, I, I've measured against the rest of the world, and they seem to be doing so much worse, so I don't think mine's a problem. Well, folks, it's all foolish. We can't hide our sins from God. He can't be hoodwinked or, or fooled. He's asking us this morning, where art thou? What's going on here? Then we find another example of routes that we try to take instead of making a beeline to God. And we find it in verse 8. It says, And they, as he, Adam and Eve both, heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. They had tried to cover their sins. Now they're going to try to hide from God himself. They hid amongst the trees that he created with the ideal they could get away from him. When we're in rebellion, we have our own ways of trying to hide from God. We may try to stay clear from church because at church, oftentimes, we're going to hear the word of God. Well, not oftentimes, every time. You hear the word of God, and, 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 and perhaps we think, well, the word of God will hit on my sin today, so I'm going to stay home. The Holy Spirit's power is greater, not greater, it's, it's more felt in the presence of God's people, but the gathering of all the Holy Spirit people, there's, a, there's sometimes a stronger draw of a person, a strong conviction of a person of their sin than they would be if they were by themselves ignoring the Holy Spirit. So, we try to hide from God by staying away from church. And, and so, so what are we going to do? What's our excuse? We'll pick one. Just draw one out of the hat. Well, that preacher, he, he, he's not this. He, he made me mad. Or, or I, I got out of church during COVID, and, and I, just, I just never have gotten back in. Well, that's, that's fine, but get back. Amen. I'm not getting fed there. Well, if you're not getting fed there, then go somewhere else, but get in church. The music is loud, the temperature's hot, the seats are hard, the walls are painted in their own color. Whatever. But really, we're just making an excuse to avoid God. We can't get away from God by skipping church. It's, it's so foolish. The truth of the matter is, there, there's, there, there really and truly, there's no limit to the foolishness that can be found in our lives when we're trying to hide from God. You see, Adam and Eve used to walk with God. They were there in the cool of the evening with Him. It was special. They enjoyed it. And then their sin and their rebellion messed it up. And now they're dreading God showing up. It's not something they look forward to. It's not special anymore. And sometimes we as wayward Christians are no different. Maybe you're here and you're wayward. You remember a day when your walk with God was strong? You remember a day when you loved to go to church? You remember a day that you loved to get in God's Word and discover new things? You remember a time when you liked to hear God's voice? Your prayers were sweet. You liked to talk with the Lord. It brought peace and joy to your life. You always walked away from God's, uh, the situation, uh, feeling fulfilled. Well, this morning God says, where art thou? Why aren't we doing this anymore? We used to walk together. We used to talk together. We used to fellowship. We used to be very close. It, it used to be very special. Where art thou? Now you're hiding. Why are you hiding? Where art thou? The truth is, Christian, you can't hide from God. You can distance yourself uh, uh, spiritually from Him in, in, in that you uh, don't want to see Him, don't want to hear Him, don't want to commune with Him, but you can't hide from Him. Psalms 139 is a great chapter. You don't have to turn there, but it speaks to that truth that you can't get away from God. When I'm going out, God, you're there. When I'm coming in, you're there. When I sit down, you're there. When I rise up, you're there. 
When I look in front of me, you're there. When I look behind me, you're there. When it's dark, you're there. When it's light, you're there. If I fly up to heaven, you'd be there. If I were to go to the, the core of the earth, you'd be there. That's what the psalmist is saying. And then David says, Whither shall I go from thy spirit, and whither shall I flee from thy presence? The answer to that is nowhere. Nowhere. There's no way to hide from God. And we better come to grips with that. So when God asked the question to Adam, Where art thou? It wasn't an, an, an inquiry of God to try to find Adam. He knew where Adam was. It was a very loving, rhetorical question designed to make Adam see where he was. It was designed for Adam to open his eyes to his situation, his condition, to cause him to realize his spiritual condition. And there again, it was a question of concern. A gracious, compassionate God looking to someone he loves and saying, what's going on? What's going on with you? The truth is, God could have left Adam alone. He could have said, hey, Adam, you've made your bed. You lie in it. You do your thing, and I'll, I'll go off, and I'll, I'll, I'll find somebody else to commune with. That's not the God we serve. He pursues us. He loves us. He, 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 he cherishes the time that we have with Him. And He's not content to just have us going astray and living our own lives apart from Him. He's not, he's not content with that. Over in the book of Luke in chapter 15, most of us have read that parable of the, uh, of the uh, uh, prodigal son many times. When that young son rebelled and went off on his own and was wasting his life away. His father was broken hearted. He never stopped longing for that boy. He never stopped anticipating that boy someday returning. And this is all seen by the fact that the Scripture tells us that when the boy did come to his senses and decided to go home, the Scripture says his father saw him coming from a long way off. What does that tell us? The father had been looking in that direction the whole time. Ever since the boy left, he'd been looking in that direction for the anticipation of that boy to return. It's as if he were saying, where art thou, boy? Where art thou, son? This is a picture of our heavenly father. He longs for those that are apart from him to return to him. There's another parable in that same chapter, Luke chapter 15. It's the parable of the lost sheep. And it reveals us to, to our Father that, that He's not only waiting for our return, but He also goes to great lengths to just seek us out. He comes after us. He goes searching for us. That shepherd had a, uh, in, in the parable, he had a hundred sheep in total, and the one sheep that went astray, it was, he was not oblivious to that. He didn't, he didn't uh, 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 fail to notice that the, the sheep was gone. He keeps track of his sheep. He knows their comings and he knows their goings. So out of great concern, the moment that sheep turned up missing, he left the ninety and nine and went off to find that one sheep. This, too, is a parable that gives us a picture of the God we serve. He's not aloof and disconnected. He's not indifferent to our, 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 our comings and goings. He's watching over us, and, and, and He takes steps. When we're moving away from Him, He takes steps to bring us back. And if we'll listen, I think we'll hear the words of, where art thou? Do you know how foolish sheep are? They're just dumb animals. And for that reason, they're a very appropriate metaphor for the child of God. Because sometimes we're just spiritually foolish. Dumb. We'll take a step or two away from God in the wrong direction. And in His grace, He makes it very simple for us to make the quick correction and get right back to Him. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, 
is faith one just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness? He just makes it very easy. All we got to do is, is recognize what we're doing and, and say, man, God, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm confessing to you what I've done wrong. And then you're right back in step with God. He makes it so easy. But like sheep, we don't take the easy route. We keep moving away. And a sheep will keep moving away and moving away aimlessly until they're met with their own destruction. Don't do that this morning if you're a child of God. You've moved away. Well, that's done. You can't fix that. You've drifted. But you're still within the sound of His voice. And He's saying, where art thou? What's going on? Where are you? Why, why are you stepping away from me? He wants us to recognize where we are. He already knows where we are. The question's so we'll realize where we are. He wants us to know the words of 1 John 1, 9, that, that uh, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. He invites us to do that very thing this morning. Hey, just come to this altar or right there in your pew, wherever, and just bow your head and say, God, I'm, I'm sorry. I want to be back in step with you. I want to walk with you. But folks, we can't cover our sins, and we can't hide from God. So if you find yourself distanced from God this morning, guess who moved? God didn't move. We moved. So what we have to do is go back to that place where we moved. We don't just walk, try to walk back in step with God and come back. And it doesn't work that way. He wants us to address where we left off. He's not, he's not asking for us to, to come crawling back and pay penance and, and all of this. No, he's just saying, I want you to see your problem. Let's go back to that problem and, and let's deal with that. And we'll go on from there. But we can't just brush it off like it never happened. And just start think we're going to start walking in sweet fellowship with God again. He wants us to address it. What happened here in the garden? God came back to the place at the time. He's always there before, and He was there that day. Guess who moved? Adam and Eve did. It was because of Adam's absence that things weren't right. God hadn't gone anywhere. Brother David and our musicians come. Maybe you're here this morning and maybe you're walking step in step with God and this is not applicable to you at the moment. But every one of us are sheep. We have that tendency to get lost, to step away. So maybe this is just for future reference for some of us that, hey, when you do step away, why don't you correct it real quick and get right back? Because God, God's saying, where are, you? where are you? Where are you going? Come back here. Maybe you're here this morning and it's just this hit the nail on the head for you. You're right. I've distanced myself from God. It didn't get better day by day. It got worse. And all of a sudden, I'm looking up. And I had not fellowship with God. Church hasn't been sweet. I've had no prayer life. I have no interest in the Bible. I just think the things of God are just kind of foreign to me right now. If that's you this morning, you're in the right place at the right time because God is right here this morning saying, Where are thou? I want to ask you to stand. God spoke into your heart for any reason. You're welcome to pray at these altars. You're welcome to pray right where you are. If you want to come through that line after church and I'm standing there and you say, Brother Chris, I'd like to talk to you, you can do that too. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If God's spoken to your heart, you come.